Welcome to Bethel Cleveland's Sermon of the Week. We hope you enjoy today's message. For more information on this podcast or how to get connected, go to BethelCleveland.com. Today I want to talk to you about the Holy Spirit being the great adventure. So I just have a question for you. Did you know that you were built with adventure in mind? That when God designed you, adventure was kind of interwoven. There's a reason why we love adventure movies and we love to explore. And as kids, we are, like my son Maxwell, exploring things that could get you injured from time to time. Like, you know, can I fly? Can I jump off of this? Can I, I don't know, climb up a tree and rip your whole branch off in your front yard, Dad? Just like, <laughs> that happened. <laughs> um, but there's something in us that is driven towards the great adventure. You were designed with great intention from your father to be the perfect gift to wherever you are right now. You might spend a lot of time or energy worrying about being on track, maybe. You know, a great test of this is your mentality, is going on vacation. I hope you all have gone on vacation at some point in the past couple of years, yes? Or at least taken a break? Well, you should know there's two types of people on vacation, two. I believe there's only two categories. There's one person who wants to relax, wants to just be, wants to go to the beach, you know, enjoy their time. And then the other type of person is the type that the second they are out of the hustle and the bustle and and the grind and the rat race, whatever you want to call it, they get out on vacation and instead of relaxing, they, they think, okay, great. Now I have space to decide whether my life is accomplishing what it should be. I'm going to have a full-on existential crisis right now on this vacation. I'm going to question everything. And typically, those two types of people end up getting married. (laughs) So one spouse is behind the wheel saying, oh, it's so great to be on vacation. And then the person next to them says, but you know, we have to talk about, are we in the perfect will of God for our life right now? Are we living in the city we're supposed to be living in? Are we doing what we're supposed to be doing? Has the Lord left us? Are we even believers anymore? Like all of these questions. And um, those two types of people fall in love. They get married and they go on vacation with each other. And somewhere in the middle of all that, the Holy Spirit typically, if the person is pliant, which, you know, in my marriage, I don't know if you could guess which type I am. I'm the relaxer. Uh, I'm not. (laughs) I'm the thinker. But typically the Holy Spirit will come in and help us to relax, right? So, For those of you who may spend time on that list, we we can ask ourselves a lot of questions when we start to think about where we're positioned in life and what it is that we are doing. Some of the questions can look like this. can say, am I on the way to fulfilling the God dream that he's given me? If you're a parent, like, am I parenting the way that I need to? Am I spending enough time with my kids? Am I disciplining the right way? You might start to ask, am I being an effective witness for Christ? Or men, am I providing like I need to? Or am I spending enough time with Jesus? Am I enough is the summary of all of those questions. In everybody's list, we all have different categories that when we get a breather and we start to talk about the adventure for our life and we try to gauge where we're at on the map of of walking into that, it all comes down to the measurement. Am I enough? You know, on all of these these measurings, these concerns, we stare at those and we're blinded to what's in front of us I want you to do something real quick. Put out your two fingers like this, you know, or whatever, and look, pull them in front of your face. And I want you to just stare really hard at them. Some of you are thinking, oh gosh, look at my cuticles. My nails are very long. I need to cut that. How'd that get under there? Um, <laughs> but when you're looking at this, the funny thing is the whole room goes out of focus, doesn't it? You're staring at your, your two little fingers. You're looking at your knuckles and you're thinking your thoughts, but you can't see what's going on around you anymore. And that's the funny thing about the measurements. Like, am I doing enough? Am I doing this? Am I doing that? Am I doing, 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 doing? It takes your focus and it puts it on something so temporary and right in front of your face that if you're not careful, the Holy Spirit could be leaping in the background, waving his arms, saying, I'm here. But you're like, and you're missing it. The great adventure can only exist when the measurements stop. 
Because the truth is, when, I, when we talk about metrics, if I were to tell you, give me your list, guys. Tell me what's going on in your heart when, when you're wondering if your life is on track. I, 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 I say this in love, but your metrics probably stink a little bit. They're probably not exactly what God's metrics would be, right? Sometimes they're just what we have kind of prioritized and valued, but are they coming from the Lord? Because here's the thing. If we lay down the measurements and we look up and we look at the Holy Spirit in our life, this is how God made a shepherd boy a king. It's how he made a nomad, a nation, a prisoner, a ruler, and a murderous Pharisee, a celebrated biblical author. <laughs> you see, 1 Samuel 16, 7 is a wonderful scripture to help us understand this. The Lord said to Samuel, when looking for the king, don't judge by his appearance or height. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. I don't know if that ministers to you, but it ministers to me. I'm like, maybe David, maybe David was 5'7". I don't know. <laughs> but don't look at the height or the stature. It says, look, oh, sorry, let me find my place here. For I have rejected him. The Lord doesn't see things the way that you see them. Isn't that wonderful? People judge by the outward appearance, but the Lord looks at the heart. Now, we're all human. I think we've all struggled with judging people by the outward appearance. You look at them like, you know, how attractive are they, their height, their weight, or any of those things that you look at and you can judge somebody for all those meaningless things that don't actually matter or reflect who the person is. Sure. But I think the other piece of that is people judge by the outward appearance, meaning we judge the adventure of our life by the current circumstances in front of us, by the place that we are specifically planted now, by the two fingers that we're staring at. We judge by those instead of the expansive open room around us that the Holy Spirit is inhabiting in our life. So Romans 8 is a great place to jump into. So if you can, open up your Bible apps. I almost want to say Bible, but I feel like everyone uses an app now. I hear pages. Someone's really rustling those pages. Oh, it's just a bag. Never mind. <laughs> I heard a bag rustling, and I thought it was pages. I was like, oh, someone's got pages. Romans 8, and let's, let's start with verse 14. This is so good. This is in the Passion Translation. It says, the mature children of God are those who are moved by the impulses of the Holy Spirit. Hmm. What are the impulses of the Holy Spirit? What are your impulses? Because when I hear impulse, that makes me, it doesn't sound like a good thing to me. It, it sounds like Jay waking up at two in the morning and going to the kitchen and rustling like, like a trash raccoon. And then you wake up in the morning and say, how did this happen with a vague memory? That's what I think of when I think of impulses. But the Holy Spirit's impulses, what do those look like? Hmm? Verse 15, and you did not receive the spirit of religious duty leading you back, listen to this, into the fear of never being good enough. There's that word again, enough. But you've received the spirit of full acceptance and folding you into the family of God. And you will never feel orphaned. Aren't you so grateful it says you'll never feel orphaned? Some, some, some here today, you might feel orphaned. You've got parents, you've got relationship, but there's an orphan feeling. The word tells us right here, it promises that you will never feel orphaned because the Holy Spirit rises up within us and our spirits join him in saying the words of tender affection, Abba, Father, beloved Father, for the Holy Spirit makes God's fatherhood real to us as he whispers in our innermost being, you are God's beloved child. If you would even close your eyes just for a moment, so many times when, when we have things that we're working on or we're going through or difficulties or areas of failure in our life, I think that we go back to that carnal mindset, that earthly mindset that says, what, what would the Lord say to me right now? Well, he'd probably tell me, you need to get this together or get that together. But if we were to quiet the thoughts, quiet the hustle and the bustle in our lists and our measuring and pause, you would hear this morning the voice of the Holy Spirit affirming your identity, saying you are God's beloved child. You are, you're God's beloved child. 
And it says in verse 17, you can say this with me, we inherit all that he is and all that he has. Say all that he is and all that he has. You were designed for adventure and you are a gift from God for this moment on the earth. Wherever you are at, whatever job you're working, whatever the state of your relationships or your family, you are God's secret weapon buried in the soil of your life right now, bringing the, the Holy Spirit in the adventure. You are the prophetic gift and solution to wherever you are planted right now. No matter how ordinary it looks, and a lot of us, you could walk around and say, well, Jay, if you really knew me, you wouldn't say that because I'm pretty, pretty bad. I, I said this to my spouse this morning, and I thought this thought, and I said it in my car when no one was around, but it was still there. So you wouldn't know. And then some of you might say, I am God's gift. You're right. You're welcome, Holy Spirit. Your design did good. For those of you, we're going to have ministry teams up at the end of that for that. We can pray for you, prophesy. But for the flip side of that coin, for those of us who feel like we're not enough or we're kind of making those lists again, I just want to say in love, when we say, how could I be a gift or I really don't believe that, I'm not talented enough, I'm not good enough, I'm not pretty enough, I'm not smart enough, I'm not rich. All of those enoughs, not only is this to a degree false humility, but you're actually denying who you are in Christ. Because think about this. Regardless of what you do and where you are, if you carry Christ, if Christ is in you, the hope of glory living inside of you, how could you be anything else but a prophetic gift to the place you're planted? You carry Christ. You have the glory on the inside of you. It's so independent of your behaviors or your earning or your doing. Christ lives in you, so you are a gift. You carry him with you wherever you go. You're a gift. It's all in there. All the miracles you see laid out in scripture and the, the people who were healed and delivered, the demonic people delivered from possession, all that stuff, that same power that Jesus operated in lives on the inside of you. Think about when Jesus was resurrected that morning on the, on the third day and it's quiet and all of a sudden breath comes back into his lungs. The heart beats, it starts up again and, and life fills and the stones roll away and light floods the tomb. That same power that resurrected Jesus lives inside of you right now as you're sitting in these chairs. It is a very now and very present Holy Spirit power that is on the inside of you. You're a gift. You're a gift to this world. Jeremiah 1.5 says, before I shaped you in the womb, I knew you intimately and I had divine plans for you before I gave you life. You are my prophetic gift to the nations. Jeremiah 29, 11, I know the plans I have for you for good and not for disaster to give you a future and hope. In those days when you pray, I will listen. And if you look for me wholeheartedly, you will find me. You see, we've got it all throughout the Bible. We have this amazing love letter from God. It's his word. It's his son, Jesus, on the page. And in his word, we hear about a God who habitually calls ordinary people to do extraordinary things and to live extraordinary adventures, right? At the heart of it all, it's not necessarily the exploits or the miracles, but the greatest adventure you will ever have is discovering the interaction with the Holy Spirit who reveals and leads you to Jesus. You see, the Holy Spirit authors adventure in our hearts by living in you. It's written in you, Christ in you, the hope of glory. And every one of you has a testimony. Anybody got a story here today? But even with those amazing memories, you, if I went around and I started asking for testimonies, I love testimonies, and I started just putting the mic around, we'd find hundreds of stories in this room of how God came through, how he delivered, how he healed, how he set free, how he showed up when nobody thought there was, there was victory or change to be had. He was there. But even with all that proof, even with all those receipts. Sometimes we look at our life because we think about it like Monday morning <laughs> and it doesn't feel like an adventure. And we look at the difficulties in our life and it doesn't feel like an adventure. But maybe the greatest adventure of your life is supposed to be difficult. 
It's supposed to be difficult at times. That's not a popular word. I didn't hear anybody say I said, maybe it's supposed to be difficult. Paul Alvarez. Everybody else is like, I don't receive that. <laughs> Everything else is pretty good, Jay, but that, mm, I'm going to pass on that. Serve something else. But here's, when I think about adventure, I don't know. We talk about adventure. The first thing that pops into my mind, and I'm so sorry, but it is Frodo Baggins. It is Lord of the Rings. Um, and it makes me think of that scene in the third movie where they're, they're not at Mordor yet, which, you know, there's a Christian theme to these books, by the way, just so you know. Um, and they're eating just like basically crackers, and they're hungry, and they're tired. And what it made me think of was that any great adventure, any story that you read, any movie that you love, anything you see in the Bible that's adventurous, it has the hungry moments, doesn't it? It has the exhausted moments, the... I'm losing faith moments, the almost failed moments, all of those before the triumphant breakthrough and the victory. Because adventure includes difficulty. Difficulty is a reliable ingredient in something that scripture tells us to expect this side of heaven. But here's the funny thing. You know, salt, this is kind of gross, but when you, if you have a wound, there's a reason why they say rub salt in the wound. Have you, have you ever rubbed salt in the wound before? You ever experience, it, sort of, it sort of feels like when you have a cut in your hand and you're working with lemons and it burns like fire. <laughs> you know, salt, the same thing that causes that sting is what seasons food and preserves it. Difficulty's a lot like that. When we're going through it, it feels like salt and wound. It feels like citrus on cuts. It hurts. But that same seasoning that causes pain in those circumstances will actually preserve your life will actually season your life, will actually make what you're serving to the world, it'll actually provoke thirst in the people around you. So the salt that burns the wound is the same salt that seasons and preserves the food and provokes thirst. Isn't that something to think about? Difficulties like that, it seasons us. It hurts, but it seasons us. James 1 is one of my favorite scriptures about this. It's a, you can say it with me if you know it. Consider it all joy when you encounter various trials, knowing that the testing of your faith produces endurance. And let endurance have its perfect result so that you may be perfect and complete, lacking nothing. Listen to this. One of the things that I love to do, it's a little trick I learned when I was in ministry school, is sometimes if you flip the verse backwards, it hits you different, right? So listen to it like this you will be perfect and complete, lacking in nothing when you let endurance have its perfect result through the testing of your faith by encountering trials. Difficulty is a part of the equation this side of heaven, and it's just like that salt. It stings a little bit, but man, does it taste good when you put it on a steak, right? Do you have any steak lovers in the room today? <laughs> Oh, and one of the best things that we can do when we're thinking about the Holy Spirit and the great adventure is to steward the memories of how the Holy Spirit has showed up in our lives well by remembering the times where he rescued us and showed up in a great big way, right? So I'd like to share a few testimonies with you. Is that all right? Um, number one testimony, it's not in my notes. It's actually not even about me, and I didn't ask permission to share it, but I hope she's okay with it. But it made me think, I was looking across the room at Allison right there. We were in ministry school together 18 years ago now, right? So you were like seven at the time, and I was like 20-something. Anyways, um, Allison was driving, and uh, I remember this ministry night, and something happened. I, I, if I don't tell this right, you can correct me later, but... She was driving, I think you forgot to wear your seatbelt, just like the one time in your life, right, ever? And she, something happened where she hit some kind of obstacle in the road and the car flipped forward like this, like from like front end to back and just turned over, over and over again. And I remember um, 
we heard about it in school and we were all just like, we, we stopped everything. We all just began interceding because we heard that Allison had been in an accident. But when she came back, she got on the mic in front of the, the youth ministry at the time and she, she told the story. She said that when she hit it and the car started to flip, that she felt like a hand came in and pressed her into the seat and she didn't move even once. And when she got out of that car, I think you just had like a cut lip, right? And when she was in the hospital, the people said, normally the people who who are in these types of accidents don't walk out of here. And so like the Lord preserved Allison's life. And I remember her getting on the mic, I'll probably, it's, it's etched in my memory. She said, the Lord preserved my life because he has a destiny and a purpose and adventure for me. And then she took that testimony and she put it onto a youth group that was filled with kids from inner city Youngstown and people who really needed an encounter with the Lord. So that story of preservation wasn't only a testimony for Allison to hang on to, but it was one that was like fed to a room of people who needed to hear that God can do anything. Aren't you just so grateful? We're so glad. Thank you, Lord, for that. Another, uh, another testimony that always just comes to my mind is, is my own. You see, um, I was a preemie. Any preemies in the room, prematures? Yes, love it. Love it. We all know that preemies are the smallest when they're born, but they tend to be the strongest and the biggest once they get large. <laughs> Um, but I, you know, I, uh, I was born purple or blue. My parents, they always told me that that was part of the story was that my lungs were underdeveloped and couldn't breathe. So I was in a, uh, incubator for the first couple months that I was alive. And my mom said that like, that's when they felt like, yeah, the Lord has something for his, for, for, for him, for Jay. The Lord's got something. They named me after their pastor and they said that they just, because they were expecting a girl, by the way. So they were going to call me Rebecca Lee. <laughs> I don't know if that would really work, right? Right now, Rebecca Lee Brogan up here. Hi, I'm Pastor Beck Brogan. <laughs> so they renamed me Jay after a, a pastor in the area after that. And then about a year later, they detected a mass in my abdomen, and I wasn't able to eat, and I was non-responsive, and I was just laying there with my eyes closed, not able to put my fingers, or just totally non-responsive. And... There's a, a type of like stomach cancer that is lethal for babies, and that's what they thought it was. Um, they pulled my mom aside to let her know that this is an, a mass. The way my mom always tells the story is that she dramatically whips open the door and says, tell me what happened. And then they tell her the story. <laughs> um, and so they, it, she was alone in the waiting room. My dad happened to not be there, and she said that she, she, she bowed her head, and she prayed, and she said, Lord, if you'll heal my son, and if you'll spare him, I will give him to you. I want to make the hand a barter. I will give my son to the Lord if you'll preserve his life. And then she got up. The pastors of the church came. They anointed me with oil. But it was in the morning when I woke up, and I was responsive. And they scanned, and the mass was gone. And nothing had... I recovered, no surgery required, no evidence that a mass was even ever there, except that I was healthy and I was healed. And, you know, as a result of that testimony, my mom would always tell me growing up, she said, God has a plan for your life. My dad would say, his hand is on your life. There's a great adventure that God has for you. And that was prophesied to me over and over and over again. So from the moment that I was born all the way till now, I have never existed in a world where the miraculous and supernatural power of God was a theory and where healing was something that wasn't accessible because I'm living proof that it is. And no matter what happened in my life, no matter what difficulties I faced, no matter what, what the enemy tried to throw at me, I had this monument that I could go back to and point at and say, the Lord has an adventure for my life. The Holy Spirit touched my body and I was healed. And so no matter what's come my way, even being sick a couple of years ago and being worried about it, the Lord healed me again then. Why? Because our monuments become the testimony that we stand on that builds faith. And, and we go before the Lord not as paupers or people who are not expectant for his breakthrough because we know who he is. And so I don't know what you're contending for. I don't know what you're believing for today. But part of the great adventure that the Holy Spirit has for you is his manifest glory 
being poured out in your body, in your relationships, and through what you put your hands to, what the Lord has placed in your hands to do in the earth. The great adventure is the Holy Spirit causing it to come to pass through nothing but our yielded lives. Isn't that cool? You don't have to be the best or the greatest. Let me share just another testimony with you. I've got maybe like two more, and then I'm gonna start, I'm gonna bring it down for a couple central scriptures here, but... So when Ashley was pregnant with Madeline, we went to hear the baby's heartbeat. And anybody who's had kids, you know that lovely sound. You want to hear that. So you wait for it, and then you get out your phone. Well, if you had a baby 10 years ago or something like we did, you take out your phone and you record it. And I just remember I, I used to walk through the house when Ashley was pregnant with Josie, and she'd, I'd hear in the back, <laughs> that audio recording, because it's peaceful to hear that heartbeat, to know that life is on the inside of you, because when you're carrying that baby, you know, you can't see it, and it's like, oh, this is proof. <laughs> And so we were going to hear the heartbeat, and we were full of expectation uh, to, to get to hear it and see Madeline emerge. And we got there, and for the first couple minutes, sometimes babies move around. You know that. Um, but after about five minutes when they couldn't find it, you start to get a little nervous. And then after about 10 minutes when they can't find it, you start to feel anxious. And then once you hit the 15 mark and they put the machine down and say, we're going to have to do an ultrasound and then leave you in the room, that's when your knees hit the floor. And I remember Ashley, just like the, the weight that came into there, and we pulled open a phone and we put on that song, Tremble. Uh, Abby was singing from Upper Room. And I remember that Ashley leaned back on the table and you know, the room felt thick. Like, I don't know if you know what I mean by that, but it felt like custard. It felt like everything, like everything stood still and that nothing was uh, gonna be okay. And I just remember Ashley sitting there singing, Jesus, Jesus, you make the darkness tremble. Jesus, Jesus, you silence fear. Steve had prophesied over each of the kids before Madeline was born, and he said that she was gonna be a laughing prophet to the nations. And so we started saying that laughing prophet to the nation. Your name is a light that the shadows can deny. Your name cannot be overcome. And kept singing it. And something came and settled in the room. They bring in the big machine. And they, they look at her, and they get the picture, and then they see that shimmering light that you can see for the heartbeat. And they said, oh, there she is. She just really wanted to be seen. This is her today. Let me get that up there. <laughs> Look at that little sweet treat with her Cindy Witt hair going on and her, her Ashley eyes. <laughs> you know, her adventure is just getting started. But in that ordinary moment where fear came crashing in, the Holy Spirit met us there. And I don't know, maybe they really couldn't find that heartbeat, or maybe the Lord just jump-started it. I don't know. But regardless, there she is, and her adventure is just beginning. And every time I look at that face, I think about the faithfulness of God, and I think about that moment where we thought we'd lost her, and how quickly the Lord turned that around. That's the adventure of God is that in those moments of pressure, in those moments of difficulty, in the unthinkable, the Holy Spirit meets us there. And he takes that moment and transforms it into a beautiful, almost six, five-year-old, almost six-year-old. <laughs> you see, the Holy Spirit in us is the great adventure. His voice, his leading, that's the adventure. It's not the destination, like we can go to Florida. If I went by myself, it would be much less fun than taking the kids there because the adventure is about who you're sharing it with, right? So the great adventure of our lives isn't the mighty exploits we do for God. It's about the interaction we get to have with the Holy Spirit. So here's one more testimony for you. Um, at, at Freedom Weekend in January of this year, uh, 2024, there was a, a gentleman who came. He, was, uh, he is 33 years old and he was diagnosed with bipolar disorder, severe mania, schizophrenia, and more. Now, he had started declining in 2020, 
and was in psych wards for the last three years. We're talking bedridden, hooked to machines, nonverbal. His doctor, his doctor had recommended that they put him in a psych ward permanently. And the family said, no way. That was on a Wednesday. So that on that Friday, they took him out of the hospital and took him to the Freedom Weekend. And the morning after, you know, Kim had prayed for, they prayed for him, they ministered, he went through the whole process. But the morning after, he woke up the next day a changed person and in his right mind. <laughs> Woo! Remember, bedridden, hooked to machines, nonverbal. His family said that he started talking, laughing, cleaning the house, <laughs> taking care of their pets and animals, starting to talk about goals, going back to work. They said, I never thought I'd see my real son again in his right mind. This is a complete miracle. Amen. Amen. So can you imagine your life without Jesus? I can't. I can't imagine a life where the natural realm and all the limitations are the only option. You see, God created me. He created you with the intention of giving us the adventure of a lifetime. So what is the adventure? It's Christ in you, the hope of glory, the spirit of God in you, leading you into the discovery of the mysteries of God. You can go to Colossians 1, verse 26. I think we'll have it up here. It says, there is a divine mystery, a secret surprise that's been concealed from the world for generations, but now it's being revealed, unfolded, and manifested for every holy believer to experience. Living within you is the Christ who floods you with the expectation of glory. The mystery of Christ embedded within us becomes a heavenly treasure chest of hope filled with the riches of glory for his people. And God wants everyone to know it. Listen to that. The mystery of Christ in you is a treasure chest of hope that's designed for the world to see. So some of you, you need to crack open that chest, that treasure chest, and lift up the lid and allow the treasure of Christ in you to come forth through the words that you say, through the people that you're in right now. Because remember, where you are right now, you are a prophetic gift from the Lord to the people around you. 1 Corinthians 2 says that God unveils these profound realities to us by the Spirit. He's revealed to us his inmost heart and deepest mysteries through the Holy Spirit who constantly explores all things. Can you think about that for a minute? Just pause for a moment. So, We've t I think I've talked to you about this before, but let's go over it again. So in your body, you've got your mind, your, your will and emotions, your body, and your spirit. But what you're actually thinking about, nobody really knows what, what, what you feel or think about things. I mean, you, because you edit, don't you? I mean, come on, let's be real. How many of you say exactly what you're thinking every time you have it? And there may be about 10% who do. And you're in therapy and you have a lot of problems with that because I mean, <laughs> you just say it. But, but for a lot of people, <laughs> therapy is a good thing. I, I, have gone, I, I have a therapist sometimes too, so don't, no, no critical judgment there, I'm just saying. <laughs> um, but when it comes to like, what's going on in your mind and saying it, the only person who's the witness of what you actually think and feel is you, right? The Holy Spirit's in there. He knows, nobody else does. So that spirit is like private. It knows the secrets of you. The spirit of God knows the secrets of God. He has all the mysteries and intentions and thoughts and will of God. The same way that your spirit understands your thoughts, God's spirit understands his. And it says in 1 Corinthians 2 that we are given that same spirit so that we can understand the thoughts, intentions, and will of God. So the same spirit that's in you that nobody really gets, you really wouldn't want maybe everyone to know exactly what you're thinking. God gives us his spirit, full transparency, full disclosure, and allows us to see who he really is. He has it living on the inside of us. 
So part of the great adventure is learning the language of the Holy Spirit. It's, it's one of the best parts of it because it's not like necessarily contingent on I'm going to do this or I'm going to do that. It's about am I obedient to the voice of the Lord? Have I done what he asked me right in front of me? And have I heard him? Can I, can I begin to hear what he's doing? It makes me think of my daughter Josie when she had that dream about her teacher. She didn't know who the new third grade teacher was and the Lord gave her a, a prophetic dream where she saw the teacher's face and the teacher's name. And when we got to orientation, she was right. The dream was right. (laughs) So the the Holy Spirit gives us the mysteries of God. He can give give us word of knowledge. He can give us intuitive things to do that will release the kingdom. But in verse 16 of of Corinthians 2, it says, "Who who has ever intimately known the mind of the Lord well enough to become his counselor? Christ has, and we possess Christ's perceptions. So my my next question, would you consider yourself ordinary? Again, we haven't even split in the room. People who say, yes, utterly so. And then we have some who say, furthest from it, I'm unique. There's never been anybody like me. (laughs) God looked and said, you're welcome. (laughs) God must have spent a little, I'm kidding. (laughs) Ashley shaking her head. (laughs) But think about it. If you think you're ordinary, well, this is who God calls, ordinary people. Noah, maybe the only righteous guy, but, you know, didn't say that he was doing anything crazy. He was, but he was obedient to the Lord and he built the ark. Moses in the wilderness was tending to a flock, exiled from Egypt and the burning bush showed up. Abraham was called into the wilderness to become a father of nations. Joseph in the pit, Gideon in the wine press, Samuel being called by the Lord, David tending sheep when his dad ignored him and and, and getting called out to be anointed as king. Mary conceiving the son of God. It's everywhere, over and over again, God using the most ordinary people to achieve the most extraordinary things for the kingdom of God. So our next step in the great adventure is learning how to be good responders to the Holy Spirit so that the great adventure guide can lead you into your destiny. So I'm going to bring it down here in uh, Daniel 6. Let's park there for just, you know what? Never mind. I I changed my mind. John 14, go there. (laughs) And this is what we're going to close with. Um, What does Jesus say about the Holy Spirit? Well, he said, If you love me, obey my commandments. He also said, loving me empowers you to obey my commandments. That's the Passion Translation. And I will ask the Father, and he will give you another advocate who will never leave you. He is the Holy Spirit who leads into all truth. The world cannot receive him because it isn't looking for him and doesn't recognize him. But you know him because he lives with you now and later will be in you. So the word advocate is the Greek word parakletos. And what the word means is defense attorney called to stand next to you as helper. When you break the word down into two roots, it goes into two halves. The first half of the word is to end, finish, or save. And the last is the curse. So when Jesus says, I'll ask the father and I'll get, he'll give you another advocate who will never leave you. What it could mean is Gosh, I will ask the Father and he will give you a defense attorney who stands next to you as helper and ends the curse. You have a defense attorney making intercession at the right hand of the Father right now for you. And you see, how does the Holy Spirit live in us anyways? It's through Jesus, the one seated at the right hand, making intercession. It's Christ in you, the hope of glory. And the adventure of a lifetime is yielding to the Holy Spirit and watching as your surrender leads you into the manifestation of his kingdom come. Could you stand on your feet with me today? So conclusion, Holy Spirit is the great adventure And you, each one of you here today, you are God's prophetic gift to the earth. Learning the language of the Holy Spirit is the best part of our adventure. And what we need to do is become aware of his voice 
and not allow fear, insecurity to prevent us from seeing the reality of God's adventure in us. We yield to the Holy Spirit. We surrender. We lean in. And we ask him, just put us anywhere. I wrote a creed for us to say together today. And so what I'd like to do is I'd like to invite our ministry teams to come forward. And in closing today, what I want to do is I want us to say this creed together. It's, we can call it Jay's Adventure Creed. <laughs> and I want you to say it with faith. You can have some gusto, some chutzpah. And, I, and I, want to, I want you to know that when you make this declaration over your life, I believe that the truths in this creed are going to begin to manifest in a greater way in your life, in your family, and in what you put your hand to. So can we say this together in faith? Amen. Say, I am God's prophetic gift to the earth. I am a host for the great adventure of God, the Holy Spirit within me. God is shutting the mouths of the lions that surround me. God is rolling away the stone in my life. I have access to the Father through Jesus. The Holy Spirit lives in me and leads me into truth. The Holy Spirit is releasing wisdom over me. Let your kingdom come on earth as it is in heaven. Hallelujah. Would you just put up your right hand? Bethel Cleveland, in the name of Jesus, I bless you to go forth out of this place. May you discover that the greatest adventure of your life is not what you do, but he who lives inside of you. May you hear, may the volume of the Holy Spirit get turned way, way up. I pray for dreams, revelation, prophetic words, prophetic dreams, all the, the, uh, all the stuff of heaven to be released in your life. Father, I pray that the Holy Spirit would be released over them in even greater measure, that they would be transformed over and and over and over again, Lord, that you would flood their homes, flood their marriages, their relationships, their families. God, I pray that darkness, discouragement, loss, all of the heaviness that the world tries to put on, I pray for a lifting off in Jesus' mighty name and a putting on of Christ, that the yoke that is easy and the burden that is light would drive them to run like they have never run before, that they would experience the abundant life paid for by Christ and that the power of the Holy Spirit would erupt on the inside of them. In Jesus' mighty name, amen. Thank you for listening to our Sermon of the Week. You can help us reach others by investing today at BethelCleveland.com slash give.